Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in to D News Plus again today for episode two of three on our series about hunger. So far we've talked about what happens when you eat, we've talked about sweet, creamy, kimey stuff. It's real gross, but it's awesome, so go back and check out that episode. Today we're gonna talk about what happens when you don't eat, and then tomorrow we're gonna talk about why we even need to eat, because come on, it's boring and terrible, right? I'm just kidding, I love food, I love it. Let us know down in the comments if you have any future episode ideas. Please subscribe to the show so that we can keep making it for you. And come find us over on Twitter. You can find the show at DNews. You can find me at Trace Dominguez. So let's kick into this. How do we know that we need to eat? You have to find out yesterday. Today, what happens if we don't eat? When you eat food, your body takes these delicious things into it and it breaks it all down and absorbs nutrients through the small intestine and turns that into energy that's sent to your cells. But your cells still need energy even if you aren't eating. They have to break stuff down elsewhere in the body and go to your storage units and break down everything that's in there. We all have hunger pangs. That's a big deal. It's not actually hunger pain, it's pang. Get it right. Also, you don't chomp at the bit, you champ at the bit, which is related, but it just has to do with pronunciation. I think it's important to pronounce things right, because champing means chewing and not swallowing. Chomping means swallowing. Anyway, hunger pangs are that feeling that you get when you are hungry, that pain that you get. You feel it in your stomach. It's a muscle contraction that causes it, and remember how we talked about how the stomach processes food, it mushes things up and stuff, churns it, mix it with juices and fluids, breaks it down, all that stuff from yesterday? These muscles do that when there's no food in there. They do that all the time. These contractions are what gives you the pangs. One researcher found this out by swallowing a balloon attached to an air hose. He inflated it in the stomach, measured the contractions of those muscles. Actually kinda crazy. Uh, but that's what gives you hunger pangs. It means that you need to eat. This is also what causes your stomach to growl. Sometimes it's so loud that our camera guy, Balthazar, can hear it in the microphones. Because I'm hungry, I'm a hungry guy. Your stomach sometimes will churn and those muscles will move stuff around and make noise. But when it's full of stuff, you can't hear the noise. And also because you like words and we like talking about specific words here on DNews Plus, the growling is called borborygmi or borborygmi. It's actually an onomatopoeia. It's a word that sounds like a sound. That's another word. Gosh, you're getting so much out of this. The contractions happen about every hour until you eat again. But hunger also appears in the brain. Talked a little bit about this in the last episode. Our brain tells us we're hungry. It's the control center of the body. It makes food memories, and it makes us salivate and want food. But if we ignore all of this stuff, we ignore the pangs, we ignore the growls, we ignore the salivation and the release of this hormone ghrelin, what happens? If you didn't listen to yesterday's episode, find out what ghrelin is. We talked about it then. So the whole point of eating is to replenish nutrients. We need those nutrients for our body to keep working. After about six hours, your body starts breaking down some reserves called glycogen. Glycogen is an energy reserve and it exists for times like this when you can't get food. It's broken down into glucose to maintain our body until the next meal. But we only have so much glycogen. It's actually not very much, only enough for about six hours. About six hours after your last meal, you go into a state of ketosis. This is when the body doesn't have enough glucose and needs to supplement that loss. So, because it can't exactly like lash out and find something somewhere else, can't go run to the store, it has to find it elsewhere. And where it goes is to your fat cells, which is why if you Google ketosis, a lot of dieting websites come up and things, because fat is broken down into something called ketone bodies. The fat has to be broken up. That fatty lipid is too big. It can't be used by the body in that form. But if we break it down, then we can use it. It can't cross the blood-brain barrier as it is to fuel the brain so you can keep thinking and functioning and try and find some food. So hopefully, you're you know, doing that. So once fat is broken down into ketones, they're small enough to cross the blood-brain barrier and that keeps your brain going. Now, if you continue to not eat, by day three, 30% of the energy to your brain is from a ketone. By day four, 70% of your energy is coming from that and your brain will need to lower the amount of glucose that it will need to function because now it's a serious issue. This is an emergency. By day three, 
you're not feeling great. Your body really, really, really needs energy. We're out of the simple sugar of glucose. We're out of a lot of the fats that were simple to break down, but the body needs more energy. It needs to keep going. We can't exactly go into hibernation mode, selfish body. We gotta go somewhere else and find some energy. So at this point, your body starts looking for proteins floating around in there. It breaks them down into amino acids, and it will become, again, glucose, which keeps your body happy, but not a lot of glucose in comparison to your stores that you used to have. But of course, there are consequences here because proteins make up your muscles. So as they're broken down, you're actually eating your own muscles to keep yourself alive. It's called autophagy. It's Greek meaning eating of self. So as your body begins to eat itself to feed the brain, you're gonna start losing muscle mass. Next, it has to break down something else because it can only break down so much of your muscle mass to you know, feed itself. Your fat's gone, your muscles are gone. Let's start breaking down the immune system. That's next. Without proper nutrients from eating, your immune system will get extremely weak because you won't be able to make new cells because your body will be eating itself. In fact, you may die of a weak immune system before you would die from a literal starvation, from literally lacking food. If you survive that far, that's hard. There are two things that might happen. Marasmus, basically energy deficiency from malnourishment and you like waste away. And then quashorocor, which results in body fluid buildup, enlarging the liver, which gives those starving people, you, you see that distended stomach? That is uh, what's going on there. There's also things like diarrhea and fatigue and swelling. And eventually, if you just let it go on and on, the body will just give out, probably from cardiac arrest because your heart muscles have already wasted away. They've been eaten by your own body, making it weak, so eventually it can't pump blood and it just stops. In 1944, at the University of Minnesota, they did a study on starvation where 36 fit young men were put on a regular diet for three months, followed by what they called a semi-starvation diet in order to study what happens during starvation, not just what happens to your body, but also the mental effects of starvation. The men, of course, lost a significant amount of weight, but they also had decreases in staminas, in sex drives, in body temperatures, and heart rates. The study was started in order to help during World War II to understand how to treat starving people. But the war ended before the study actually did. Because if someone is starving, I don't know if you've ever had experience with this or seen a movie or a television show, you can't just give them food. If someone is literally starving, they can't just walk into a McDonald's and buy you know, a big meal. It won't work. There needs to be someone easing them back in. Because otherwise your body might get shocked. It's not used to all of these glucoses and sugars and amino acids just flooding the body. You know, it'd be like, sitting in a car that's broken and jamming on the gas pedal. You're gonna break it even more. Recently, scientists have found really, really interesting stuff that the effects of starvation don't just affect the person starving. They can last more than just during your lifetime. A study published in the journal Cell found pregnant worms that were starved passed on a genetic memory, if you will, of that starvation to the next three generations because starvation changed their DNA. It's called epigenetics. Researchers think that this is a way for parents to prepare their children for future hardships. Essentially, the worms are saying, hey kids, don't be super hungry when you're born because we won't have that much food. And that might give them a chance for survival. Whereas if they come out expecting lots of bounty, and don't get it, they might die. So now we know what happens if you eat food. And get that sweet, sweet chyme. Now we know what happens if you don't eat food. Not a lot of great stuff. But tomorrow we wanna to talk a bit about some of the technologies and some of the ways that you could go without eating food and not experience starvation. It's gonna be really cool. Let us know down in the comments how you felt about this episode. It's kind of a downer, I know, but really interesting, right? Have you ever gone really long without eating? What's the longest you went without eating? Let us know in the comments. Make sure you subscribe so you get more DNews Plus, and make sure you come follow us on Twitter. We're at DNews. I'm at Trace Dominguez. Thanks for tuning in.